Alright, so in this video we're going to introduce a new uh, statement and talk about how we can use that to make our um, database work a lot safer. And it also has applications to things like opening and writing and reading with files. So it'll be a really useful statement block in general. Um, we're just talking about uh, nine from the focus part of this chapter. All right, so when you actually bind um, a data set to your application's uh, controls for the first time, you're actually going to get some pieces of code automatically filled out for you in your form main uh, definition. Uh, the first that I'll talk about is just form main underscore load right here. This line of code just the form tells itself with me right here to um, I've essentially fill out the data in the data set based on the actual uh, database file that you have. So this um, table adapter dot fill method takes in the uh, courses uh, data set or the, the data set dot courses table and then fills it with uh, data from the specified actual database that you kind of did the setting up all the way back at the very beginning of this chapter. So, um, you know, you just need that in there so that every time you launch your application, the data set gets data from the database. It pulls that data from the database, whatever data that you need. The second is an event procedure for the actual save um, button right up here in the, uh, the binding navigator. And when that save button is clicked, it's actually going to save data to the database. Uh, so any of the changes that you made, it's going to save them properly uh, using these three methods. The first is a validate method right here. And then there's these other two, which I will explain momentarily. But you get this event procedure, which is, um, you know, the event procedure, it activates when you click on that uh, button, just like any other button uh, click event procedure. And it just gives you the code to successfully save all of that data. So we saw two methods um, in that last event procedure that I showed. The first one being the uh, binding source and edit method, which uh, any pending changes that you have in memory, if, you, if you've actually changed any of the cells or added records or deleted records or anything like that, you haven't actually saved those changes yet. They just kind of sit around in memory. So when you click the save button, the first thing that happens is end edit gets called the binding source and edit method, which stops any edits from happening momentarily. It kind of queues them up, but it, it, it pauses edits from happening. And then it will take those pending changes, ch changes you have and apply those changes to the data set in memory. Um, so it's like you, you make those changes are not even applied to the data set yet. You, you just have in memory a list of changes that you want to make to the data set. Well, end edit actually applies the changes to the data set. And then the table adapter managers update all method takes whatever uh, changes have been made to the data set and actually updates the database file with those changes. So it commits those changes and pushes all that changed data, you know, adds any rows that need to be added, deletes anything that needs to be deleted, changes any cells that need to be changed, all that kind of stuff. So those are the methods that are at play here when we're actually saving stuff. The problem is, is that errors can happen when saving your data. Errors can happen when you write changes to the data set or errors can happen when you commit changes to the database. It, sometimes we don't know why they happen, but like there might be interruptions in how memory, you know, like how memory gets transferred to the storage device, or there might be some weird mishap in the calculations that prevents data from being correctly written to the data set, or the computer might completely lose power or something like that. I mean, you know, the computer losing power is not an error we can really help. But the other ones, like there, there might just be random hiccups. A, a random photon might hit your memory and flip a bit wrong and something might bad might happen, right? Uh, if errors like that happen as you're saving your data, that would be bad. So we say that an exception is an error that happens while 
uh, the program is actually running. Not like a logic error like we talked about before. This is more um, an exception is uh, kind of what a, it might be considered a specific type of runtime error in a sense. A, a, an exception might be along the lines of like the um, hard drive cracked up for a hot second while you were trying to save a file or something like that. Uh, or, you know, it, it might even be things like you're trying to open a file that doesn't exist or you're trying to divide by zero. Like, I, I, it does have a, it does actually have a lot of overlap with runtime errors now that I think, not that I think of it. But yeah, these are just, we say that an error happening while an application is running is known as an exception. And you can write code to handle exceptions that might possibly occur. Um, things like the, uh, Errors that happen if you try to open files that don't exist, or the errors that happen when you try to divide by zero the wrong way, or all that kind of stuff. Um, if you don't handle those exceptions, or you know, like an overflow error might be would be an exception or something like that. You can write the code to handle the exceptions. If you don't write that code, then Visual Basic does it for you. And usually what Visual Basic does is it gives you a runtime error and then crashes your application, which is not ideal. But that's what happens when you don't actually handle the exception yourself is that Visual Basic creates the runtime error. Um, now, if you don't handle an exception that happens when you're saving changes to a database, uh, then Visual Basic will crash, which means that you're crashing during saving, so changes that haven't been committed will be lost completely, and you might even corrupt the file that you're working with, which would be really bad. Brownie face uh, for effect. So you don't want to crash when you're saving at all. It, that would be absolutely disastrous. So what we have to do is we have to learn how to write that code to handle exceptions that might occur. Well, the tool that we can use is the try catch statement. You try to run statements that might throw an exception and you want to be careful about what you're trying to run because you don't want to bundle your entire program into a try catch statement because then, oh, now my program will crash. Or anything like that. That would be actually disastrous. What you want to do is you run only the bare minimum of lines that might possibly crash from a very specific type of error, such as an error that might happen when you're saving your database, or an error that might happen when you're trying to open a file for reading, or something like that. But you try to run the statements that might throw an exception, and then you prepare to catch that exception. If the exception is caught, you can run statements to either correct it or to disregard what's happening and move on, but like at least you haven't crashed or at least you're not relying on the result of calculations that had to stop because they produced that exception and resulting in the application crashing or something like that. You can run the statements to correct everything to like kind of get out of that bad area where the exception was caused and then sort of like reset and maybe try again or allow the program to close out cleanly or something like that rather than just crashing. So the try catch statement looks like this. You type try and you type everything that you think might possibly cause an error. Uh, again, as few statements as possible, only the, the statements that might, you know, the, the, the statements that you are exactly worried you know, might suffer if there was an error. You know, like a statement that might cause an error and then any, any statements that might be dependent on that error not happening. Um, but regardless, uh, you would hit try, write the stuff that might cause an error, and then you unindent, you hit catch uh, ex as exception. Um, what you're actually doing is you're declaring an exception uh, variable right here that will hold in some kind of exception object. Uh, and then you have a whole bunch of stuff that you can run if the um, exception is actually caught, if an error happened in your try block. Essentially, that's the statements that are running. And then you have this end try thing to show that you're no longer working in the um, danger zone. Now what happens when you run your try catch statement is the lines of code under the try block will run as normal. Um, and then if it runs completely successfully with no exceptions, it skips to the end of this end try thing and it keeps on moving on. However, if try, 
you know, sort of gets interrupted right here, uh, then it will swap over to catch and then um, actually run through the uh, statements within the catch block. And then as soon as everything in catch is done, it will end and so on. But when you um, have an error happen inside of try, uh, if it happens on line three of 50 lines inside of the try block, well, it won't run any of anything after the exception was thrown. It just skips everything that was remaining in the try block and goes immediately into catch. Um, so if an exception happens, it just stops what it's doing immediately. Nothing else in the try block gets run. Everything in catch gets run and then end tries. But if there's no error in try, then everything in catch is ignored. There's also an optional finally block, which, um, you know, try, everything in try gets skipped if you uh, have an exception show up in there. But if you have an exception, then everything in the finally block will also run. So if there is an exception in try, then you go to catch and then you go to finally. Um, as opposed to, you know, if there's not an exception, you go to try and then... Uh, and then you go directly to finally. So if finally, if these statements in here need to happen, no matter if there is a catch or not, then finally is a good place to actually, you know, put it. Here's an example of uh, the try catch statement being used to actually handle opening a file and reading from it. So we have this inside of the try block. We open up the file names.txt for reading. Uh, we add everything inside of names into this list box and then close the file immediately. However, if there is an error in actual, um, actually like opening in file, for example, if um, names.txt doesn't actually exist, then this would normally throw an exception. And if uh, we throw an exception right here, that means we can't actually open in file as a stream reader, which means that we can't actually read anything from the stream reader because the stream reader isn't open. And it also means we can't close the stream reader because the stream reader is not open. So that's why we put all of this inside of the try uh, block right here. But if names.txt does work, and assuming all of these um, read lines also work, for example, like there could be an error here if the file got mysteriously deleted in the middle of running the application, for example, which shouldn't happen because usually a lock is put on the file so that it can't be deleted. But regardless, like if something bad happened here, that would cause another exception and that would break into the catch block as well. However, if none of that happens, then we just exit, you know, go, go to the end try area and then end the sub procedure entirely. However, if there is an exception, we catch it, we save that exception inside of our ex variable, and then they uh, demonstrate putting a message box on screen. Um, which, in this case, it's not really helpful. It doesn't really say anything other than sequential file error. It doesn't even use this ex variable. The ex variable actually has information about how to use the exception, but this doesn't use it at all. So this may not be the best message box to use and you'll see how to use the exception in just a little bit but you know you can actually put the error text of this exception inside of your message boxes which is really cool but this is an example of what you can do you can have a message box pop up that says hey there's an error just so you know that's why this didn't work and you do want to signal to the user that something bad happened so you want to probably put a message box inside of your catch block alongside anything else that might need to happen. Here's another example. This actually uses the um, the same courses binding navigator save item underscore click thing that I had just showed off. So you put all of the method calls that Visual Basic puts in automatically inside of try, and then inside of the exception, you know, you catch the exception and then your message box, you can put ex.message, which is the message of the exception. Uh, it will, the exception always has some kind of message that says what went wrong. So you can display that message to the user in the message box. 
with the title course information and you know all the other stuff so this is what you will want to do every single time you actually uh, add in your binding navigators you want to go to this event sub right here the courses binding navigator save item or whatever the binding navigator save item is actually going to be called you know the name of your table binding navigator save item right but you want to go to this uh, click event procedure and immediately wrap these uh, method calls in here that save your uh, changes inside of a try catch with the catch giving a, mes a message box that shows the actual message of the exception. But this will help prevent your changes from being lost if something bad happens between end edit and update all. Because if something bad happens and the exception is certain, you want to catch it rather than crashing it. If you catch it, then that gives the user time to try saving it again. Maybe it can be recovered. But if you just let it crash, then there's no chance of it being recovered at all. So you want to do this every single time. All right, and that is try catch. It is really helpful, a really helpful way of catching any runtime errors you might, or preventing any runtime errors you might expect happening, whether that is involving indexing or, um, you know, getting data from users that might try to make you divide by zero or saving or opening files or anything like that. Try catch is always really helpful. So I highly recommend you, uh, you use it.